think it was last Thursday, we, we started doing with the inserts, updates, and deletes. And our first case was just like the simplest case that you could possibly have, where we just took the, the standard out-of-the-box functionality for updating a grid view and a details view. And it's pretty nifty because it does a lot for you, but nearly none of the time does that make sense? Nearly none. <laughs> Nearly none, yeah. Almost never, almost never will the, the, the standard uh, basic default functionality be enough because there's no validation to it. It's all text boxes. Uh, it is pretty simplistic. But, hey, that's okay, right? Because we have choices. We can extend the functionality of it um, by... Uh, using the template columns. And the template columns are what allow us to go and take something that it's doing and saying, we don't want to do it this way, we want to do it that way instead. So we don't want to edit, we don't just want to edit the item, we want to edit it and we want to throw a validation into it. And what we're going to look at today is edit stuff, but instead of having a text box, have a drop down for something. All right. Um, we also saw that it didn't really do too good of air checking. I mean, it would let you go and try to do it, and if it blew up, it blew up. And it blew up in a really ugly way. And by ugly, I mean that the framework handled the error message, and it just dumped out some error message that wouldn't really be comprehensible to, to a typical user visiting the site. And again, I mentioned for security reasons, you can suppress those error messages um, because, again, they, they sort of give a little bit too much information to someone that could be potentially trying to infiltrate um, your system. So you could, uh, you could uh, suppress those, but still the user would be no better off. They'd get uh, an even vaguer ugly error message, all right, that really wouldn't give them any idea at all. Probably be something like, uh, what is that, uh, server error? 404. Yeah. Well, 404 is a page missing. 500. 500, I think, is a server error. I don't know. They might get something like that, or they get something goofy saying, hey, this thing blew up. All right, which really isn't, isn't too meaningful. So we saw how we can, again, go beyond the default vanilla, very basic fundamental uh, functionality and extend it to do better error, error checking. So we're going to continue on that theme. Uh, we're going to play around a bit more with the error checking just to see some of the things that we could do if we wanted to. All right. We are going to put in a confirm for the deletion because that was kind of abrupt. <laughs> when you click delete, yep, it's gone, all right. Um, and we are going to then go into what if we want to use a drop down instead of a text box for something. Like we're going to go and we're going to create the ability to edit a poll, all right. And with a poll, there's a category ID. Well, if it was a text box, you'd have to know the exact category ID that, that, uh, to put in. And, you know, the user won't necessarily know that, right? The, the user um, would, uh, you know, rather choose a list from a list of categories and, and have it populated. So we'll see how to do that as well. So that's what we're doing over the next day or so, all right, depending on how far we get today. All right. Elsie actually has hired someone to go around to my classes and push the squeakiest cart they can find <laughs> just back and forth. I am convinced of that. This has been going on for more than one semester. The other thing they've hired someone to do is to take the magic markers or the, the, the board markers and smash the point in. Now that person, I have a feeling I know his name. All right. <laughs> And You're not paranoid. No, I'm not paranoid. <laughs> Remember, when they are out to get you, it's not paranoia. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's go and bring up our example from last time. We'll spend a second revisiting this. I was actually
potentially thinking that as well, that, that at the very least they should send a thank you saying thank you for the people who did vote, work on the campaign. Yeah. Actually, it passed by like 75 votes, wow. Wow. which means that there's like automatically a recount. All right, because with, if it's within a certain percentage rate, there's yeah. a recount. Plus, absentee ballots only, uh, there's probably some absentee ballots out there that haven't been voted because I think it had to be postmarked by Tuesday. Okay. So, like, when they announced the election results on Tuesday evening, they, they couldn't have possibly have all the absentee. Plus, there's things called provisional ballots, which, like, if you vote, if, like, there's something disputed about your vote, like, you go and you say, hey, I'm a registered voter. It's like, we don't got you on the list. And you say, forget that. I know I'm on the list. They'll let you vote, but then they'll figure it out later if, if you're scamming them or not, right? And, and that's called a provisional ballot. In other words, they'll verify if the ballot really is valid or not. If it's valid, it counts. If, it, if not, they, they pitch it. So, plus there's like people, military can vote sometimes, you know, and, and it takes a while. So, um, I, I heard that folks are, are optimistic about it because they don't think that there's that, that there's enough of a that there will be enough in this close of election to like make up the 75 votes and all that. But still, I think people are holding their breath until um, it actually might not be like towards the end of November till they have an official verdict on it. Um, that's when like the election is quote certified, you know, and, and they they uh, announce the results. Um, so I, I have a feeling that's probably why, you know, because they're celebrating, but it's kind of celebrating with like a, oh, you know, yeah. well, let's celebrate, but, you know, we're still not 100% sure. So I think the celebrations have been a little restrained because of that. It's surprising because I was watching a recorded show and it had some of the results last night. I didn't see that this one in particular, but some of the Yeah, uh, the the voter turnout was pretty low, and that's what um, that's what I think the fear was in this election. Um, that you know, and again, I, I I don't like to discuss politics in class, but this is sort of the facts of the situation. There's a certain number of people that are going to vote against the levy no matter what. Those people make a point to get out and vote. <laughs> All right. It tends to be the levy supporters that like, well, I'm sitting this election out, you know. So the, the people that are iffy about voting uh, are the people that tend to vote for the levy. So they really want to make sure they get people out and vote. That's why they sent the million emails out, you know, and, and, and all that. Um, and, and this is like sort of a, I mean, I don't even know what else was on my ballot. I mean, school board member or something. Not that that's not an important position, but it's not like, you know, a presidential or a governor election, you know, where it's really like a high profile, or a Senate, or even a Senate or a, a, a congressman election, where it's really like, you know, uh, sort of marquee value. So I think that's what, what the concern was, and that's why they were all um, very, in, very aggressive with their, with their marketing. But still, a thank you note would have been nice. Yeah, that's what I just said to Kathy so, before I made a comment. So on behalf of LC, thank you for those of you who, regardless of how you vote, cared enough to exercise your, your, your uh, right as a citizen. There we go. I'm considering a career in diplomacy should this computer stuff not work out for me. <laughs> And it's funny because, like, what are the chances that anyone in the administration is going to watch one of my videos on YouTube? Right. You know, one in a one. trillion. Yeah. But it's still in the back of my head. <laughs> Don't say too many stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Saying no stupid things is probably impossible. Right. That, that's an unrealistic goal. But we can, we can, we can cut down on them. Okay. All right. Anyhow, back to... Back to... Something that I hope I say even fewer stupid things about, actual code. All right, if we look at this, a couple things I want to point out. All right, first of all, and if you guys want to get the lights, go ahead. 
first of all, with this category example, we went and the one thing that we did is we converted the category name into a template column. Where you see template, that is um, where you're going to customize the way it works, as opposed to getting the default behavior. All right. So, like, any time the thought comes up, like, I want a drop down instead of a text box, yep, make it a template column. I want to show both names together instead of showing a first name or last name. Well, that's different than the default behavior. So, boom, I'm going to make, um, I'm going to make a template column. All right. And if you go to edit templates, you'll see the different templates that you have available. And I'm going to click on, the way I like to do it is I like to click on the name of the column. Then I see all the templates all at once for that particular field. Or you can go through them one at a time. But I generally like to see all of them all at once. And what we have is we have an item template, which is the basic display of the field when the grid is in read-only mode. And this also applies to details view, by the way. Details view is no, not, not really different at all than this. All right. We have an alternating item template, which we can use mainly to do things like do the different color bar going across so that it helps people read across the grid. So both one and two, item template and alternating item template, relates to the, uh, the way this is going to appear when the grid's in read-only view, read-only mode. Um, edit template is where is what we're going to have appear when we're editing this column. And again, we kept the draw, we kept the text box in there, or actually we added a text box. Or maybe it defaulted to a text box. I don't recall. But what we definitely added is the validator. And the validator we can go and we can look at its properties. And we can go and we can associate the validator with our text box there. And we can put our validation error message. That's the whole reason we have to do this, right? We can't simply slap a validator on a page like we did before because this control is sort of a conditional control. That text box isn't always on the page. That text box is, text box is only on the page when we're, in, when we're in a certain mode, when we're in an edit mode. So we can go and we can add that. So that's the one thing that we did. Again, template equals customizing. So we did the basic bare bones one before, now we're into customizing it to make it work better. The second thing we did with regards to customizing is our error processing. And I'm going to play a little bit more with this, just for, for laughs, just to show what the capabilities are. All right. And we identified that associated with Every control, there's a series of events that we can write code for. If you double click on the control, it takes you to like the default event, the event that it, it thinks you probably want to code. All right? But you can access a lot, you know, all the other events as well. And we also mo no noted that some events have sort of two forms, a present tense and a past tense version of it. And the present tense one, the code fires off before that thing happens, whatever that thing happens to be. And the past tense one fires off after that event has occurred. So for example, there is associated with grid views a row updating and a row updated event. The updating would be any processing that you'd want to do before the row gets updated. One second. The row updated fires off after the update has been attempted, whether it's successful or it fails. Yes? How did you get to that event here? How did I get to that event? Excellent question. Because that's not necessarily obvious. And actually, it's harder to do it in C Sharp than it was in Visual Basic. But, hey, that's, we're not going to let that scare us. 
How you get to it is I just totally lost my train of thought. Oh, on the grid view. We look at the control that we want and I go in here and I can see all the attributes that are associated with grid views. Well, all of the events start with the word on. So all the, all the listings in this IntelliSense that start with on are my events. So there's a whole slew of them. And to be honest, I couldn't even tell you what all of them mean. All right? On calling data methods, on creating model data source, on data binding, on data bound. Again, present tense, past tense. On disposed, on init, on load. Page changed, page changing. All right. So we go and pick one, and I'm going to go and pick on row deleted equals create new event. And now that event is in our code behind file. And in fact, it's actually good that you ask that question because we kind of need to put this code in there when you delete too. Because we could have errors when you delete, not just when you update. So I'm going to go and I'm going to copy this code into here as well. Um, and I'm going to uh, possible causes here more than likely the cause here is polls exist for this category. Because remember, we have a foreign key set up between poll and category, and I think we have restrict delete. So if there's a poll existing for that category, we can delete it. So anyhow, that's how we get to it. Now, let's look at this a little closer and identify exactly what's going on here. Again, this, this fires off after the update or the delete has been attempted. And the update, at this point, the update or delete has been attempted, and it either succeeded or it failed. So if it succeeded, no big deal, right? We just continue on our merry way. If it failed, though, we want to intercept that problem and display an error message, all right? So how do we know if it, if it succeeded or failed? Well. We know based on whether there is a, quote, accident report out there for it, an error report. Well, what is that error report? That error report gets passed to this method as this object, e.exception. e is the what are called the event arguments. That's all the information is being reported about just what happened. For example, let's look at E. Affected rows. This tells us how many rows were updated. So again, in, in this case, it's going to be one row or zero rows, right? But in other updates, we could have some sort of mass update that goes and updates a bunch of things, in which case it would tell us that. Keep in edit mode, new values, old values. There's a whole bunch of things that we could pull out of there. All right. Well, one of the things that we can pull out of this event argument that gets passed to this method is whether there is an error or not. And we know if there's an error or not based on this object, the exception object. You know, when you see the word exception, think, think error, think problem that happened. We look to see if that is not null. Not null means that there's something there. Something there means that there was an error. This 
portion of the lecture brought to you by Dr. Seuss, apparently. <laughs> we look to see if something's there. If something's there, it was an heir. Yeah. And because we care, yeah, I, I better stop now. Uh, it's probably already too late. But. We look to see if there's an exception. If there is an exception, we want to do something about it, right? Remember, someone has to deal with this exception. It's either us or it's the framework. And we know how the framework deals with things. It deals with them, but not in a very pretty way. Just by spitting out the most uninformative sort of error message for a typical user. All right? To use the Huffmanism, it's like a Microsoft employee that's been smoking one too many Douglas furs. <laughs> he does have a way with words, doesn't he? All right. So in this case, in this case, if there is an error, what do we want to do? Well, I'm going to concoct my own error message. Because I know what's likely to go wrong with this. Remember, with database errors, you know what's likely to go wrong. And what's likely to go wrong is you're violating one of the constraints you set up in the database. All right? In this case, pretty simple update operation. We're only updating one field. The really only constraint is, number one, that we don't have a duplicate category. And number two, that we have omitted a category. Now, we took care of the omitted category with the, with the, uh, with the uh, validator. So probably it's a duplicate category. Or it could be some just unusual, weird circumstances. The database server crashed in the middle of doing this or whatever. All right. So I can concoct a message that is descriptive to the user and tells them what to do and tells them what to do to recover. All right. So I do that, and I display that on a label on the page. And then the last thing I do is I tell the framework that I handled it. So it doesn't worry about it, and it doesn't handle it. So this is the mechanism by which we sort of stop the framework from handling it. We've already handled this error, so you don't need to worry about it. All right. If we didn't set that to true, it would do our code but then it would go ahead and the framework would, would handle the error as well and would get our big ugly error message again. All right. So chances are, if we're writing code here, we want to make sure we set that because we have handled it and we want to move on. All right, questions about this? We have almost the same thing about delete. The only thing I did is I changed the verbiage of the error message because if we can't delete something, it's probably because there are related rows to it. So like if I run this and try to delete sports from here. So if I go and delete sports. The reason I can't delete it is because there's polls for sports. And the the constraint was set not to cascade delete, so therefore it's going to restrict delete. So it's going to try to delete it, but it's going to give us an error. Now, if we want to, I'm going to comment this out for now, that exception object actually gives us some information about exactly what happened. So instead of setting it to a message that I make up, I could actually pull out of that exception object any number of things. There is a inner exception. There's a get base exception. There is a message. There's a source. And the ever popular two string. All right. I'm going to put two string on there. <laughs> All right. What this will do is this will take and make a string out of the exception. All right. All right. Well, that is much better. 
right? I mean, that's the same as the system message. But the only thing that's good about it is that uh, at least I stay on this page and I don't get the ugly system message. So maybe that isn't a good idea. Maybe I can try this instead and do message. something like this. I display a message I make up to the user, but I take exception to string and like stick it in a log file somewhere. Alright. Or trying to think. I could put this like in a hidden field, on a hidden panel, and say, email this exception to the developers. I could do a lot of things with that. So, Or, maybe, when I am working on this and debugging it, I will want to see the full exception, but when I go into production, I want my exception error. Uh, you know, my, the, error that, the text that I make up for this. So you can do a lot of things with this. All right. The idea is, is that you can report the error one way and you can maybe log the error some other way if, if you wanted to do that. Where will we probably not log the error, by the way? This is almost a dumb question maybe, but we're probably not going to try to log a database error in the database. Why not? Well, if there's a problem with the database, you won't be able to log the error either. So you might just spit that out like to a sequential file, some sort of error log, all right? Because again, if, if, if the problem is something severe with the database, where the database server has crashed or whatever, it's going to do you no good to try to write that error to the database. You, you know, you'll have to put it somewhere else. So you might use something like a sequential file that's very straightforward to write. And if you can't write that, then, you know, grab the kids and hide, you know, and, and head to higher ground, because you really got problems if you can't write just a plain old sequential file, all right? Okay. Confirming delete. Now, with confirming delete, We can almost guess what we have to do before we do it. All right? In some respects, you know, what this is, is this is customizing the behavior of this. In other words, we don't want that delete link to immediately delete. We want it to ask nicely and then delete. So we need to make a template column, all right? What do we want to make a template column for? Well, if you haven't noticed, the first column in this data grid, or this grid view, is a, a command column, where we have our links to edit and our links to delete. So I'm going to go in, and I'm going to make that edit columns. I'm going to turn that command column field into a template field. 